How do you do? And welcome to this session. For those of you who have stayed late in the day, um, not only do you get to listen to this great talk that we have for you, I understand there's a party afterwards to celebrate what we've told you. <laughs> so, um, But uh, Gapreet and I are from eBay. We work out of the Seattle office. and. Um, we want to welcome you to our session, and I want to tell you how Hadoop enables eBay's uh, entity recognition initiatives. These initiatives support creating great experiences for our customers, which include both buyers and sellers, as well as for fighting the kinds of fraud that undermine trust in our community. Uh, in short, this is the problem that we are working to solve. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of millions of accounts, we have more than a few hundred millions of accounts, but that's what legal would let me put up uh, across our properties and partners. Uh, you can read this, but the main problem we're trying to solve is identifying which accounts belong to the same person. It's a, it's a real classic business problem, but it's also very important. It simply stated, which accounts represent the same customer? Uh, it's a deceptively simple problem statement as well. It's easy to ask, it's really hard to answer because we have to reconcile from many different sources. We have data that's coming in in different formats. We have data that's coming in in different character sets. We're a global company. People are registering for their accounts in Hebrew, in traditional and in simplified Chinese, in Cyrillic, in Arabic. So uh, we, we see all of this, um, and we have customers who are constantly updating their data. So it's data not only that is uh, in different formats coming to us in different sources, it's also dynamic. It's, it's changing over time and evolving. Um, and all of this data, too, is subject to a great deal of variability. Uh, when you're doing the customer entity recognition problem, you're trying to say which accounts belong to the same person. And I, I give you a personal challenge that when you get home and you open your mailbox, I want you to look at your mail, and I want you to look at the amount of variability in the way something as fundamental as your name and your address are represented. And the, think about the kinds of challenges that presents uh, for anything that you're doing at really large scale and purely mechanically without the benefit of a human brain looking at it. So that's, that's the problem that we're solving, but the good news, it's a problem that is solved. And uh, while it's hard to do under normal circumstances, doing it daily and at the scale that we do is, is a feat that really defies superlatives. Um, Hadoop and the tools that are built upon it really have allowed us to solve this problem at eBay data scale. And breaking the problem of uh, entity recognition into a series of unit operations and fitting them into the MapReduce model has been particularly effective for us. So MapReduce gives us a robust design pattern for solving this problem. Uh, Gapreet, you want to talk a little bit about our technology stack? Because yep. we don't rely on MapReduce alone while it's very key to what we're doing. Yeah. So, can you hear me? So on the technology side, as you can see, it encompasses most of the things that are there. So uh, MapReduce has proved out to be the most stable technology, the underlying technology that we have. So we have dealt with Spark. Uh, there are certain components that we wrote in Spark. Spark is really awesome in some areas, but uh, Overall, what we have seen is the stability of Spark has gone down at scales that we, we have. And uh, from one release to the other release, we have had challenges in Spark, but it's still one, one of the component. We have, wrote, we have written some components using cascading. And uh, cask we created an in-house ETL tool known as Karta, and, uh, which uses cascading. And that, again, uses MapReduce. And, Again, the benefit of stability has come through that. And Tom, initially when we started, so uh, we wanted to use an awesome graph processing technology, and at that time we had Giraffe. Mm. And, Tom's, and Tom will talk more to it, but we spent a lot of time actually building a solution with Giraffe first, and then realizing that when Giraffe changed, 
then it didn't work. <laughs> and then Hive and MapReduce has said that uh, if you can meet your SLAs, then our experience has shown that Hive and uh, MapReduce are quite reliable. So overall, if you see, we can say Hive, MapReduce, Cascading, Spark, and of course, we can build anything on Hadoop, but rest of the ecosystem is still on RDBMSs. So everything has to be exported back to Teradata. And again, we had good challenges there. Probably we'll talk about that uh, in, later in the presentation. So yeah, so this is the technology stack on which we have built this solution, and Tom will take more. Yeah. Now, as I alluded to earlier, we were able to break the problem down into a lot of very manageable sub-problems. And one of the virtues of doing that, referring to the previous slide, is that where it makes sense, we can swap out the technology that we're using for that unit operation because the flanges between what goes in and what goes out are fairly straightforward. So it gives us the ability to evolve our process without having to completely re-engineer it. We can swap out where it makes sense and take advantage of uh, advances that give us better performance, better speed, or new features. But we have very much a modular solution. And this is a simplified diagram. The next slide is gonna be a little bit more busy. That's the manager's diagram. But this gives you the, the high level overview. What we have is we have data sources that come in. And as I said, they can be heterogeneous. And then what we do is we, we solve the entity recognition problem by breaking a pattern that has been followed a lot in the industry of uh, what's sometimes called match and merge. We're not gonna do a match and merge where whenever we find two things that match, they nucleate together and we build up or, or grow entities that way. Rather, what we're doing is we're looking initially at the data pairwise, and that's what this stack of cylinders uh, represents. What we do is we take our sources and we apply different strategies for blocking and then matching. Blocking is simply this. If I have a billion accounts and I want to compare every account to another account, I wouldn't be able to do it uh, at least in my lifetime, possibly not in the lifetime of the universe because that's, that number of comparisons just is intractable. So what you do is you break up the problem and you say, well, uh, accounts that share an email in common are going to be interesting, and that makes a small block of data. And then if I take the data associated with those accounts and do matching among those, that's a much more manageable uh, process. So each one of these cylinders represents a case where we had a different strategy for slicing up the data into manageable blocks and then matching uh, within those blocks. And what that does is it gives us edges that says account A is connected to account B using this blocking and matching strategy. And so we do that edge creation process. And that's very much looking at the customer account compared to another customer account. It's a narrow view, but we limit ourselves to that point deliberately. Then we take those edges and we use them to build out the customer graph of what accounts are connected to which other accounts. And also we're interested in how are they connected? What is the structure of that connected component? And so we basically uh, identify the connected components and do some work to validate are connected components because it's not enough to say all of these things that are connected are the same customer. There's the possibility of overgrouping. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but we, we actually construct the connected components in the graph, we validate them, and where we have identified uh, conflicts within the, that cluster, for example, if I have grouped in a cluster of two accounts and one of them belongs to John Jr. and one of them belongs to John Sr., I've overgrouped a father and a son. Or if I have two accounts and one of them clearly has a name that is female and the other one has an account that's clearly male, I've grouped a man and a woman somehow. I need to do something about that. Or if I have accounts that are connected that have different dates of birth, obviously I've, I've done something wrong as well. I need to partition the graph. We want to identify those cases 
and we want to partition the graph to uh, correct it. And then finally, once we have identified all of the entities, which accounts belong to the same customer, we want to publish it. Now, I'm going to go a little bit back to the edges again. Something that turned out to be very useful for us in solving this problem in this way is it ended up creating not a customer entity solution, but rather a customer entity uh, platform. Depending upon where you are in the business, the way that you define customer can be very specific. If what you're trying to do is to decide whether I'm going to put an ad in front of this person that has a chicken or an ad that has a monkey and do an A-B test, your definition of customer could be very loose. You might say, well, anyone who shares an email address, that means they share some kind of a secret because they know the password. I'm, we'll show them, the, we'll consider them to be the same customer and that's okay. That would be like a householding model of the customer. If you're looking to make an offer of credit or something like that, you want to be really sure who you're dealing with. You want to know this is, in fact, the person, and these accounts are that person and that person alone with a high deal of confidence. And because of the building it this way, we can select which buckets full of edges are appropriate for that definition of customer. And you can mix and match the edges. You can import edges from third parties. You can uh, have different strategies for creating them. Uh, you can filter them on criteria and based upon that, put them into the graph and come up with a customized definition of a customer that fully resolves. So that's what it looks like uh, simplified. This is what it looks like to the managers. Gurpreet, yeah. do you to want me. to talk to the managers? <laughs> I'm not his manager. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> so, as as uh, so, this sorry for the for the font here. I I picked this um, image from a wiki. So, so, so the main important components here are the ingress section where we are acquiring data uh, from external sources, uh, Teradata, or maybe a third-party system. And if you see, the idea here was that uh, whatever properties or whatever companies are there under eBay's uh, landscape, we should be able to acquire PII information from all of them and somehow correlate everything to create a graph of a customer. So that tomorrow, if you want to know that this customer, what is this customer doing in a StubHub? So we should be able to figure out, okay, what, what is this customer spending in uh, eBay? So we should be able to do that. So uh, anecdotally, we, the way we started here was we said that, okay, let's go ahead with a snapshot view. We'll, we'll take the data from all the different sources and uh, put them into one single table, uh, do all the PII decryption and everything. And so we'll have a snapshot data set and then start building the graph out. So this was the iteration one, and we did that, and then we realized, oh, we don't know the history of this. If a person has moved from address A to address B, we should be able to link them based upon address A also. So, so then the next step was we decided that, okay, let's go ahead with Delta. Basically, we'll compare today's with yesterday and then uh, build the history for the entire customer. So this was a kind of a ramification, an additional advantage that we got. Uh, so we started building the history of customer changes, the PI information changes, and uh, the touch point changes. So if your address has changed, if your uh, name, anything has changed, so we, we, we started tracking that information. The third party area where we, we, we get some data set from third parties like Axiom and all that, where they do some linking from uh, for us, uh, which which proves out to be good in most of the scenarios, but in some cases they are, yeah, it's at conflict with us, and so we have to take measures to rectify it. So the initial ingress set is written all in Hive. The technology that we use is Hive primarily. Um, one of the good thing that came out of this entire uh, exercise was that we came up with a concept called as normalization libraries. 
Well, normalization libraries are a set of functions, actually, and we wrote a generic UDF and all that by which we can access any of the, uh, any of the functions that are there. So that gives us consistency of operation throughout the, throughout the flow. So the next step, once, once we have the ingress data, we moved in, move into creation of buckets. So, and there is where, where this uh, blocking uh, and creation of edges come. Right now, we have around 22 buckets, and they constitute around 15 billion edges. And uh, probably we'll talk about it in later in the presentation. There was a scenario where we went up to 330 billion and what happened at that time. So once the edges are done, uh, and Tom will talk more about that process, uh, we create the graph, we do validation and everything. Now, so at the end of this for today, we have a view of a customer. Now this customer has account A, B, C, D. Now product came up with this requirement where they would like to have history on top of that. Now how this graph is changing over time. So we call that process as entity versioning actually. So we track the change of the graph over, try, over time and that goes into the entity versioning process and that's here. So in a sense, we are trying to build a snapshot as well as the history of whatever changes has happened to the customer over time. And once everything is done, then comes the Teradata export. So we export this data set to Teradata. And again, this initially, we thought that it's, it's, it's an easy process. We will just shove the files over to Teradata as FTP and then just import them. But that didn't work out actually at the scale that we had. So we, we went and worked with Teradata. Create, uh, they came up with a technology known as Teradata Bridge, and we are using that. And it's been working OK for now. So Tom, yes. edges. So uh, you've seen the edges now in the two previous slides. In the one case, it's the cylinders. In the other, uh, it was a, a the, that middle column. What each of those represents is a collection of accounts that have been connected pairwise based upon a strategy. And we use multiple strategies for doing the blocking and matching. And we use multiple touch points, phone numbers, uh, email addresses, physical addresses, uh, some tracking information that we get from trust and safety, uh, all kinds of, any, any clue that we can use to pull together, are these two the same person? We will use those to pull together. And then at some point you have to uh, answer the question, are they actually the same? And uh, that involves matching. And so we've uh, developed our own matching engine that's rule-based that lets us use things like edit distance, uh, a two-tier nickname table, uh, use truncations, all kinds of string manipulation things to check whether two things are similar enough for us to determine that this first name and this last name and that first name and that last name are actually the names for the same person. And for each strategy, we, as I said, we write the output to a bucket. It's a segregated uh, repository of the edges for that rule that we can choose to use or not use, depending upon how we define the customer. And each of these strategies, were, uh, blocking matching strategies, we're running as basically a pure MapReduce job. And in order to make this be manageable, instead of having a lot of custom code, we have a very generic code, and it's all configuration file driven. And the mapper portion uh, basically is able to read data from simultaneously from multiple different file types. Uh, so we can read text files, we can read sequence files, we can read Avro, we can o read OCR, and we can extend as we need. And then we're also able to read all of the different kinds of layouts that you can encounter from that, whether they're fixed, delimited, JSON, or CSV. And as you read each data field, you're also able to do transformations and normalizations on them and define how you do that in the XML. Because for each field you can have uh, in the XML, for that field you def you're defining, say, if it's a delimited file, you're saying in position three is going to be uh, the, the address line one field. 
And if you want to do some transformations on it, like I want to remove any leading and trailing spaces, and I want to convert it to uppercase, you have a normalization attribute in the XML where you can just as string stack these normalizations and they will be applied to that data as it is pulled out of that out of each record by the mapper. And so if you say, I want to trim, uppercase, and then uh, do a replace all of the letter A with the letter Z, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you could do that. You can, it's a very nice normalization library that lets us do some really cool magic to the data as it gets uh, deserialized. So we've got, we're able to do that. We're also able to combine fields to create composite fields, which is very useful, because sometimes your data is coming in as address line one plus address line two, and you want to just mash those together and create a single address. Uh, so that's, this lets us do these things, and it also lets us burst records. So for example, we can have up to five email addresses on any one account. And we want to be able to map, uh, uh, use that as the map key, and emit, say, the name as the value for every possible distinct email address. This lets us take one record and create out of it uh, many key value pairs. And then that all gets fed to the reducer. And in our reducer, we're able to embed our rules, uh, a rule-based uh, matching engine. So if you can describe how you would match two things as a series of if, then, else, you know, a directed acyclic graph, for those of you who like to call them those things, you can code that up in XML, and it will go through that logic flow and apply the magic of matching to, for it, and either exit with a true or a false. And if you exit with a true, it says, OK, those two records that we have considered match, we will emit their edge. Uh, likewise, we've been able to embed Lucene indexing into our, our reducers, which allows us to, say, block on something that's much more coarse, like, say, a zip code, and do some fuzzy searching, and then do name and address matching. And that's been a beneficial thing to do. It's a little bit complicated, but it, every, every customer, every account, pair of accounts that we bring together represents an opportunity for eBay to make a better customer experience. So that's how we do the matching. And the edges, as I said, are the building blocks for our graph. And in order to solve uh, the connected component problem, we've written our own iterative map reduce that takes the fact that uh, record A is connected to record B, and record B is connected to record C, and now A, B, and C have formed a connected component. Now, A and C, we may not have a direct connection for them, but that's OK. But what we say is they're transitively connected. But having those kinds of transitive connections has a, an implication for the result. Uh, it can create an opportunity where I might have a record for John Smith Jr. that matches to a record for John Smith. No problem with that. And I might have another case where I have a record for John Smith Jr. matches to that record for John Smith because there's no generational suffix conflict. But I really would never match John Smith Jr. to John Smith Sr. One's the father, one's the son. But it's very easy to get them in the same connected component. So we take every connected component and we analyze it and we look for possible conflicts in the data that says we have overmatched. The main things that we look for are, have we matched a man and a woman? Have we matched a father and a son based on generational suffix? Have we matched two people with a different year of birth? And then we take the graph that we have now that has the edges that are good, and then edges that might indicate a conflict, and we reconstruct that graph. It's a smaller graph than the big one that involves the billions and billions of edges. Uh, as you would expect, a normal customer might have a handful of accounts across all of the eBay properties and maybe several within. So it's, that cons constitutes a fairly small uh, graph in terms of looking at it. Uh, so we send each graph then to a mapper and run it through a small graph analysis to say, have we overgrouped? And if we have overgrouped, should we partition it? 
if we haven't overgrouped, how confident are we that this cluster represents a single person? And this is really important for the people who are consuming what we're producing. Because the first question they ask is, how good is it? Should I trust it? And what we're able to do is say, OK, the records that we, uh, uh, the clusters that we give a data quality level of one, that's USDA grade A beef. That's very high confidence stuff. The stuff that has a level two, there's no conflict, but it has a weak graph structure. We don't think we've overgrouped, but there's a higher possibility that it is. We're just not as sure. And then we have the cases where we had uh, conflicts. And we're what we're telling our customers there is, this customer here is someone who's very easy to confuse with someone else. They almost had us, you know, busted. Uh, so we can even tell you who they're easy to confuse with. And in those cases, actually, there's a higher likelihood as well of undergrouping as well as a higher likelihood of overgrouping. And then we have another category, which is kind of interesting. You don't expect someone to have more than 500 accounts. I mean, what's going on there? There are actually some really valid use cases. But in any case where we have more than 500 accounts, we say, OK, this is a whole other class of customer. It might be. Uh, a legitimate thing. It's just not your normal situation. Um, in fact, let me exit here for a moment, and I'll show you what some of our graphs look like. When, when I say we want a densely connected graph, this is what we look for. And this is actually a completely densely connected graph, because every uh, vertex is connected to every other vertex. Let's see if we can make that a little bigger for you. Um, so this is a bit of a contrived example, uh, but that's what we would grade as a level one very easily. But you could have a case that might look like this. And the question is, have we overgrouped here? We don't have a conflict, but if you were to partition this graph, say like this, it would have a higher modularity than the unpartitioned graph. Uh, here's another possible way to partition it, but the maximum modularity is achieved here. So it says this is a case where we have a graph that may have, uh, because it has an underlying community structure, it might be a case of overgrouping. We wish we could connect more of the dots, but we don't have the data that allows us to do so. And that's why our confidence in this cluster is lower. And I'll show you a few. These are actual examples of some cases where we have this data quality level two. That's uh, one. Uh, here's another one, which would be optimally partitioned like that. Um, but we're not going to partition it because we don't have conflicts. But what do we do when we do have conflicts? Uh, here's a case. It's kind of interesting. Um, when you have a, the yellow lines here are, represent the conflicts. And we treat this kind of like a social network where lines that are connected by a matching edge, we'll think of them as friends. The ones that are connected by uh, the yellow lines, the conflicts, we'll think of them as enemies. And we apply a logic that basically uses the law of triadic interaction, which says the friend of my friend is my friend, the friend of my enemy is my enemy, and I think you know how they all go. Uh, and when we do that, we can partition this graph such that it would look like that. We now have subgraphs that do not have any conflicting accounts within them. And it, they're kind of like snowflakes. Every graph is a little bit different. But in these cases, we're able to partition them. In, in a case like this, we'd say, OK, this is pretty straightforward. We've probably just done two people overgrouped. But what will often happen is you'll see something like this. And then when you partition it, you see that, a, that one in the middle, he's acting like a hub between the two. And we give him a special label as well to say, that's an account that is responsible for a lot of the overgrouping. And that's going to be really interesting when you go in to do audits of your data, audits of your entity recognition. There's something funny about that data that's causing it to want to pull these other people's accounts together. So this is how we go about validating uh, all of our clusters so that we can tell our customers just how confident we are that each uh, account 
or each each uh, entity is correctly resolved, and and people like it. And when we're able to show them pictures like this, they get it, and uh, they feel good about using it, and they believe that we have a good solution for them. I'm going to turn it to Gurpreet. He'll talk about how this has not been a lot of fun to get to this point. So. Well, it, it has been a journey for us. Um, when we started working on this, we thought everything will be very smooth. It's Hadoop, right? It recovers by itself, and everything works fine. So, and uh, so this is basically some of the things that we have learned and seen. So first of all, Hadoop upgrades are really dangerous, actually. So whenever they happen, <laughs> they kill us, basically. <laughs> so it's like you spend a lot of time figuring out why things are going slow and um, why everything is not functioning as you thought, they, thought it will. But yeah, so Hadoop upgrades, so you have to be very careful around that during those times. Now, it's a shared environment. So when we started, uh, Probably we were the only ones who were working on this large-scale ETL thing on, 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 Hadoop, on, on Hadoop clusters. Then we started putting more stuff of ours into the same queue. And then, yeah, so it, it's snowballed, actually. So we have a shared environment. We run into issues like you don't have space. So what do we do, actually? So we have to set up retention. Earlier, we, we went with 30 days of retention, thinking, OK, we can recover and all that. Now we are down to three, down to a week, actually. And probably it may come down. So yeah, one of the disadvantages of Hadoop being so successful is now everyone wants to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so shared environment, again, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good property. But yeah, as, as people start adopting the environment, it becomes a pain, actually. Now, source data issues. So, this 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 graph that this chart that's out here is is very interesting. So, so uh, in RDBMS world, we know that keys are fixed; they will never change. So, primary key is there. If a new one comes in, you will have a new row and everything, right? And uh, suddenly, what happened was. Uh, our, our job started taking eight. It started taking 12 hours, 16 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours, and then it stopped working. It won't complete. And uh, we started analyzing what, what's going on, actually, because um, we, we didn't, have an, didn't have a clue. Then we saw that these changes, and uh, there were a lot of changes, actually, that were happening, a lot of changes. And then we realized what was happening was at that time, eBay and PayPal were splitting. And PayPal account ID had an extra space in it. And, and we thought that it's a key, actually, we'll send a space in it. So we didn't do a trim on it. And what was happening was in the validation step in the graph, actually, it had to do a lot of, lot of work, actually, to, to delete all those extra records, to duplicate edges that it had created. So that caused the volume to go from 11 billion edges to 330 billion and we stopped. Yeah, so yeah. that was a good learning experience. So always put a trim everywhere. <laughs> 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 and then owner changes. So owner changes is, ag is again an interesting area. It's very difficult. We, we, when we started, we thought, OK, we'll have less number of owner changes who, there, there shouldn't be a lot of people who will change their names or who will change their date of birth and everything like that. So, but that's again a problem. So we have seen that a lot of people, a lot of activities like that, and that's again causing issues with linking and everything. So though it's very difficult to change an owner in PayPal, but still we have a lot of such scenarios. Knowledge is a very important thing. So everybody, so. So what we have learned is that nobody knows anything about the data, actually, not even us or not even people who are responsible for that data. Because data at this particular scale will always break the rules that you think that they should follow. So uh, there have been scenarios where uh, we thought that data should behave in this way. 
but it it didn't actually mm -hmm. and uh, the key sh uh, the format should be 32 characters but it goes to 48 and all that so yeah. things change a lot so and with this one of the big areas actually of uh, uh, with, with, with big data is how do you test? So you've built a solution, right? How do you verify it? How do you cover all the scenarios that can happen? And uh, that's a challenge, and that's an ongoing challenge, actually, that probably every one of you will, might be facing because of the variability of data, right? Now, too many mappers. This is another one. This is an interesting one. So we, our, our system has 88,000 mapper limit, actually, around that figure. So, and we generally cross that. So how do you now, my viewpoint was that, oh, this small file problem or all that, we, we will never reach that. And uh, turns out in six months, we are there. So <laughs> but we, had to, we, we came up with this compaction routine and all that. So it runs, it compacts the file and all that. But now the data grows. So you run into problems of a lot of mappers and everything. So. <clears throat> And since it's a shared environment now, you you and you are putting additional stuff. So how the the scheduler can't schedule your code actually to run so all that. So uh, that's an area that uh, that's quite interesting, and that's that's a challenge actually that will continue. Now too many versions is another area. So yeah, another we sometimes since we are keeping track of the entire history. So we, we have reached, some customers have 500 versions or so. So are they changing every day, whether it's a data problem, whether it's something else? So the other thing is that what we've realized is that building instrumentation to measure how your stuff is working from the business standpoint, right? So from the account standpoint, like how many new accounts were added or how many were deleted and all that is as important as building the solution itself. Because if you can't see from the business perspective, from, from the actual requirements perspective, how your code is doing, especially in big data world, it, it, very soon you will see people will stop using it, using the solution. And one of the reasons we built this uh, linking solution on, uh, on Hadoop was to replace an already existing 360 linking solution, uh, which was overlinking, like million customer into one and all that. So, as I said, we run into space issues a lot, so we are working to get more space allocated, but let's see. <laughs> and then we, we had a problem with large clusters, so, and Tom probably will speak more to uh, it. Basically, you end up creating some massive skew, which is a pain in the ass. But, <laughs> uh, but. Okay, so these are the performance numbers. So, yeah, so these are, to us, since it's a batch process, these are acceptable actually for us. But yeah, definitely there's room, room for room for improvement. So over the time, if you see, this is the data growth actually. So we started with uh, around 130 GB per per day, and uh, then we realized, oh man, we are it's it's growing a lot. So we are running into space issues. Now what do we do? And since we had built it in modular fashion, actually we decided to go to ORC format, and that, if you see, has plateaued. Basically, it has not plateaued, but it has reduced the rate of data growth, actually. So that's an advantage here, because the way the Hadoop solution has been written gives us this ability to change the file format and without impacting the upper-level application level code a lot. So that's a good thing. Uh, on the execution times, yeah, the overall execution time, if you see from, for us, it, it's right now around 900 minutes. So from start to end, so it takes yeah, a lot of time actually to process around 15 hours or so. But that includes the buckets, the ingress computation, the versioning, the validation, and uh, uh, almost the Teradata export and everything. So. So yeah, definitely there's room for improvement, but considering our earlier solution used to run once a month and we are running daily, so it's a good improvement actually. So. And uh, yeah. summary. So in, in summary, as you said, we're doing entity resolution at scale. We're doing daily processing of the full data set that is growing over time, as you saw. We're getting very accurate results that uh, our users love. 
and we have a, a fairly reliable and stable process. Uh, we've got exciting plans for in the future for improvements, uh, but there's really not time to talk about that. But I think we have time for some questions, if uh, there are some. We'll start here. Yes. And the report runs on Hadoop that we make acquisitions, which we do a lot. The problem that I've faced is, say, so when you talk about those files, the pristine group A logging. Yes. As far as how much, how much, how many pairs of matching that we're doing? Oh, to the what, what the end user gets to see, they don't get to actually see the graph unless we're doing the demo or they ask specifically for it. What they get is a flattened version that says this account, this account, and this account. They're the same person. They all have the same uh, customer identifier from our process. And so they don't have to deal with the problem of consuming the linking. They just will take it on faith that we linked it correctly. And we give them this confidence code that tells them how sure we are that this is a correct uh, customer entity linking. So that's queryable on Teradata tables? Yes. Yeah. So it becomes a we export it to Teradata for them to consume. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll start with the corner of the room and we'll come back to you. Yes. Yes, we actually had a good conversation about this. And what I try to enforce is uh, an edge is kind of like a pregnancy test. And you can't be a little bit pregnant. Either you're pregnant or you're not. And if you have three edges that say A is connected to B, it doesn't mean you're going to have triplets. It just means that they're connected. So we don't do any weighting of the edges. Or we do weight the edges, and they all have a weight of one. Well, I take the philosophy that if it's good enough for this definition of the customer, it's met that threshold. And you know, what am I going to do with it afterwards? If, if, if I didn't think it was a good edge, I shouldn't have made it that connection in the first place. That's, that's actually the, the posture that I have taken. So if the definition of the customer says, I don't like that rule, we have a platform that lets us create a view of the customer that does not include that rule. Because I'm not sure how you would disqualify the rule. And if you wanted to disqualify the rule, you should do it at the time of matching. Right. You're, saying you're, you're building a complex enough rule where you're rolling out any rule you want your Say again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all deterministic matching. So there's no probabilistic matching going on here, which uh, I think is really necessary for this kind of solution. Sir. Uh, can you describe uh, the uh, end user experience? So your views, it looks like you're pretty much in everyone wants to say the output feeds that you create, are they uh, consistent? Meaning you group the same records today together tomorrow, obviously, or are they also persistent? If I am the user of the data, the same graph tomorrow will be identified by the key that has the same value or will they change? Uh, the way we've constructed it, that uh, in, in general, it, so it's very consistent and very stable from day to day. Yeah. Um, we have the versioning that can let us see how things have changed over time. We don't, at one point we were seeing a lot of flip-flopping that was happening because of a bug. So the versioning really saved my bacon at that point by identifying the bug. But the way we do it is uh, uh, in a connected component, the account with the lowest value lends its identity to yeah. the cluster. 
and that gives it some stability. And especially since account numbers tend to be issued in sequential order, that helps with the stability. So yeah. you're nodding, I've answered your question. Yeah. Good. Sir. Yes, we daily do a full build. So how long is it going to take you? 15 hours total, end to end. 15 hours between starting to suck in the new data to when we publish it to Teradata. Teradata. Okay, and then how big is your cluster? So cluster on the Hadoop side, it's uh, 2,500 nodes right now. 2,500 yeah. nodes right now. So, and so we it's a have fairly a, modest cluster. So we have around 6% of that capacity, actually. So that's another thing. And uh, uh, we have a similar, that's uh, entity recognition 2.0 job also running on the same cluster. And so, yeah. So yeah. after that, things have slowed down a bit. 6%. 6%. 6%. Okay. 6%. Yeah. We'll take the gentleman at the back if he speaks up. Oh, from start to finish, before, um, so we started in, well, let's see, we started, I, I want to say we started in, I, I came on in February of 2014, mm -hmm. and at that point we really didn't have much of anything. Uh, you joined about a month later. A month later. It's a fairly young team. I actually wrote a lot of the code for the blocking matching part. Gurpreet and our engineering team did a lot of the data ingest and publishing stuff. Uh, we we went to production in February of twenty February fifteen actually. February. So it took us about a year to to build the whole new system down Thanks. to Stern. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Cool. There um, was another question. Three to him. Uh, they they still become part of the graph. They're an army of one. They're uh, 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 they're a graph of, with one node and no edges. So they're, they, th the policy that we have of the lowest account lending its name to the cluster will work for that as well. Singleton. So that's what we do. We call them a singleton. Yes? Yeah, we have about 15 different strategies for blocking and matching. So give you some examples. We'll say one of the strategies is accounts with the same email, ad that have an email address in common, and the names match exactly. That's one strategy, and it's very easy to implement. Then we'll have one where the names satisfy a fuzzy matching criteria. So it goes through checking for nicknames, uh, truncations, or possible spelling variations. That's another strategy. Uh, like Lucy, with, Lucy. We have a case where we'll do, uh, we'll push the data into a Lucene index name and address and pr use that for creating a prospect list and then do approximate string matching on both name and address simultaneously within that, z that geography. So those are just some of the different strategies. We will also take hints from o other outside processes where like for example, some accounts are just manually linked together Set from links. some other process. We'll pull the name information and make sure that the names are similar enough in addition. So we have, as I said, about 15 different ways, any way that we can. We'll use any, we'll use any clue we can that, that, that we believe will satisfy the criteria that these are the same people. So, yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, exact same I used to work for Axiom, so. Hey. 500 clients, uh -huh. so, so obviously you have the, the background for, from uh, these types of solutions from before. But my, my question was uh, more related to splits, how do you actually manage splits? Yes, in this type of right. So what we do is, uh, as you saw the way we partition it, one of the things is we're looking at the structure of the graph and we prune the edges. At this point, we calculate a, a value for the edge that's called its similarity. Uh, as I said, we're, we're using this social network model in that, uh, identify the underlying structure. 
And if, if you remember, I said, well, we'll think about connected dots as friends and ones with conflicts as enemies. The idea is, well, we'll come up with a weight for that edge that says, the number of friends that I have, that you also have, if we have an edge between each other, that, the, that divided by the relative size of our social networks will be the weight for that edge. It's basically the cosine similarity, if you were to put it in, in vectors. Um, and so we now have the similarity for all of these. And what we do is, uh, if you're familiar with Mark Newman's work on modularity, he was a physicist at the University of Michigan, um, we've modified his modularity to, to be the, the, actually the modularity for a weighted graph where the edge weights are the cosine similarity. And we've also modified it a bit to take this triadic interaction. So we have a friend, similarity based modularity and we calculate a pro, you know, the antagonism between them. So it, basically we figure out if this were a party and these two people were a boy and a girl who decided to split up, who's gonna be in the kitchen crying and who's <laughs> gonna be out on the deck where the beer keg is commiserating with his friends? And who's gonna be staying inside in the den where the video game is? And that's how we end up partitioning it. So we, we prune the weak edges, the ones with the low similarity, until we come up with uh, a graph structure that either satisfies maximum modularity uh, or we'll keep pruning so that we have no clusters that contain conflicts. Yeah. So we just cut the weak edges first. The great thing is it is consistent. It doesn't matter the order in which you solve the problem. You will always get the same solution. A lot of uh, ways people go about solving that problem. If you put the data into the process in a different order, it'll give you a different answer. And so that gives us a very stable split process. There was a question here. Of the output? The, the, key. the key of the output will be the account ID and the connected component, the X ID, the comp connected component ID. So the graph that we have. Mm -hmm. So each graph that we create is is identified by the connected co by a connected component ID, which is the lowest ID of the account in that graph, right? And then let's say if we split it, so now we have two graphs. And it's the lowest ID. It's in the, the lowest sub ID, subgraph. So the key becomes actually the, I, the account ID, the account ID plus the lowest ID of the subgraph that we have. And then it becomes a RDBMS table actually, and then we export it over and people use it. All right. Oh, okay. Well, so sorry. So when I'm talking about blocking and matching strategies, the blocking strategies is a, a way to take the data and and put into manageable chunks. And for each strategy, there's going to invariably be a different uh, key. So if I use the case of I'm looking for things with the same email, I will map on email. And now I'll have a set of serialized name and you know, date of birth and any other information that I have that I want to pipe into my mapping algorithm. But I know that these things all have the same email address. So that now becomes my mapping key. Yeah. I could do the same thing for uh, the uh, phone number. I might take a literal of the address. I might take a munch version of the address. Uh, for the thing going into Lucene, I might take the zip code in the country. So whatever I need to block on, that's my mapping key. Yeah. You normalize it and put it into the mapping yeah. key. Yes? You use the Lucene in search index. So what kind of the function, what kind of function is Lucene in play in your Well, what, what it lets us do is when you're dealing with name and addresses, as I alluded to it when we started, if you go home and you open your mailbox and you, you look at the letters, you're going to see so many variations on your name and your address. But the zip code, say, and country will be consistent. This, what Lucene lets us do is say, okay, for this record, here's the name and the address. Return to me the n most similar records to yeah. that. Put it in the simplest form. If I live at 
315 East Sutton Street, and my name is Tom Schweiger. Any other record with the, with the word Schweiger and Sutton in that zip code is going to be of great interest to me. Mm -hmm. Or any of the Toms who are living at a 315 or even. So it takes very little uh, things in common to pop into that prospect list, and then I can do the approximate string matching on the strings to map. Yes. 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 Like why do these two records come together or whatever it is that you're going to get questions about this right. data, right? Or from, is, uh, how do you form your, that sort of a research in an efficient manner when you're dealing with heavy? Uh, well, one of the great things is I can pull back all of the edges for the connected component and I can pull them at by the bucket. So I know that these two accounts were matched by this particular strategy. Yeah. And that, says, that, that basically says it all. So they met the criteria of having a name that was similar. They, they, had the, they have an email address in common. I, I don't even have to look at it because I know they're from this one bucket of edges that they have the neat email in common and the name satisfied the fuzzy matching. And yeah. so that, that simplifies a lot of the operation. So what, what were the, what's the provenance of the edges in that connected component answers a lot of those questions. Yeah. We you created, don't even have to look yeah. at the data for much of it. We created a tool actually once, so everything was done. Now we had this uh, query from customers that why are these two accounts linked? Why, why, why? So what we did was we created an analysis tool where you give us an account ID and we will go through all these areas and get the PII information, get the bucket information, and get basically all that information, put it into Neo4j, right? And then you can visualize why they were connected with bucket how and everything, connect, how they are connected. How now. many connections, because you can have multiple connections between two yeah. nodes, that's great. Yeah. So that gives us the information, and that was a tool that we used. Neo4j. Neo it's very easy, very easy. We just have to grab the information and put it into it. Yeah, the demo that I showed <laughs> there, was that was just a little D3 JavaScript, so, yeah. <laughs> Oh, how much data, that, what he has there on the right-hand graph is how much new data are we adding every day. So the total amount of data, I think it's a metric fuckton, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, 88,000. 88,000, yeah. so basically. So, yeah. A few. <laughs> So yeah, that's again the property of capacity scheduler that and we, we I, I love working at eBay. I was doing some cleanup and I realized I just deleted hundred and forty terabytes of data that I don't need. So woo. Anyway. Any final questions before we end the session? One more? Right. So you don't have an issue of updated data. Yeah. Actually, we do have we the do. issue of updated data. We, cap, we actually have to follow accounts as they change over time yeah. because an account can change owner. Yeah. And that creates a whole set of complexities that I think we're out of time to discuss right now. Yeah. But we actually want to preserve the transitive connections created by the previous owner while assigning the current owner to the correct cluster. Yeah. It's neat. I worried about it for months. <laughs> there you go. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks for staying. <laughs>